Okay. Uh, right. So this paper is about garbage collection. So not the usual kind, but in the you know <laughs> programming language, right? Where isn't that the usual kind? Yeah. Uh, any case, I have to say that this uh, slides came from uh, uh, the authors of the paper, so I sent them an email saying that uh, if they could give me permission to use it for this meetup. Uh, and they came back really quickly, so I was very pleased, that, uh, and they gave me permission to use this. So this is done by the authors, uh, not by me. Uh, so if you find this online, it's because it is, it is by the authors. They can communicate communicate with the high like Sorry? <laughs> ah, oh, yes. So anyway, they gave a nice name to this uh, the paper. I bet they have much better uh, name than than view. So the acronym is O R C A, right? Orca, which is the uh, the, the, the memo you see here. Uh, so it stands for ownership and reference counting based. Oh, it's not reference counting R C. It's re reference collection. So the C is for collection. Okay, didn't know that. Anyway. Uh, in the actor world. So, I mean, if you follow the work of the authors, they're actually involved in this new programming language called Pony. I think it's sort of the PhD thesis of the first author. Uh, in case you don't know, I mean, when you read papers, right, usually the first author is the PhD student, the last author is the professor. So, in case you're wondering. So, actually, I emailed the professor. So, just to. I think she gave this at a workshop uh, in Europe. Anyway, uh, I'll skip this. Anyway, I think that this is the motivation of why study garbage collection, right? So, uh, this is Doug Lee, la, if, you, if you don't recognize. Uh, Doug Lee is somewhat famous for the Doug Lee malloc. So, even in um, non garbage collected languages, uh, if, like your basic primitives like malloc, it's difficult to do these uh, fairly efficiently for high performance systems, especially for multi core, multi threaded systems. Imagine you have two threads asking for memory at the same time, right? How do you allocate and so on? I think Dakie was talking about uh, the JVM. He, he does quite a bit of work on concurrency. I think he's on a concurrency um, team for the JVM. I'm sorry. Uh, so for most languages, you have the problem that um, if your garbage collection is uh, concurrent, which is what you want, otherwise you have to stop the world, stop everything, and do garbage collection. So if you want concurrent garbage collection, uh, then they run together with the the application, and the application could be making changes to the the memory, right? And that's problematic for your garbage collector because it's trying to ascertain a particular state of the uh, objects in memory to collect the, the garbage. So you need to resort to things like synchronization and other tricks to, uh, or read barriers, write barriers to get things to work, but they reduce the performance because all these barriers uh, make, include additional instructions when you try to dereference or look up uh, an object. Okay, so um, I think this is interesting because uh, we are moving to a very special uh, system, which is actor-based. Um, so this is from Carl Hewitt, I think in the 70s. Um, the idea of actors is uh, they have, at least in, in Pony anyway, they have behaviors. So if you call a behavior, it is, it, it is in some sense asynchronous. You don't get back any result. Um, but so it's like, the idea is like you send that actor a message. I mean, they, they, here they call it calling its behavior. And uh, this, actually this algorithm relies on two essential properties of the system. So the first is the behaviors of actors are atomic. So they don't happen in the middle of garbage collection. So at least to the garbage collector, the actor behavior is like a single step operation. So in a sense that solves kind of the concurrent problem, right? Because there's, no, there's never any concurrent activity with the actor and the garbage collector. So that's kind of nice. Um, but it's still useful because this is kind of something like the Erlang system where each actor has its own heap. So, and it garbage collects its own heap, which is relatively small um, compared to, I mean, the typical shared memory system like the JVM, in which there's one gigantic heap shared by the entire uh, application. So each, in this case, it's sort of individual heaps. And the second property is causal messaging. So when the actors send messages to each other, they <coughs> exhibit this, they follow this causality. So if one message was the cause of the other, it would, it would arrive before the effect. So the cause is before the effect. The, the, the general notion of, I think there's more details in the, in the slides. Anyway, okay, so the two key problems uh, 
here is, okay, for example, your actor might send an object to a different actor. And then it itself does not hold any more references to that object. So how would it you know, be able to garbage collect, right? Uh, and of course, references to the object. Okay, so here I think there's something which is not really mentioned here, but it's in the paper, is that the, the, the trick here will be to have every actor, uh, when it constructs objects, it constructs it in its own heap. As I said, there's the individual's heap, right? And the actor is responsible for also cleaning its own heap. So, which makes sense, right? So you, an actor can only garbage collect its own heap. You can't garbage collect some other actor's heap. So all separate. These are sort of mini heaps, or not the, the gigantic heaps we're used to. Um, so, but of course the trouble is the actor may send objects around and how does it keep track of this object right, when it goes to other actors and so on. And then there's the idea of foreign references, uh, which there be more details. And then the foreign references might change because of objects being sent around and then you can just interesting idea here, you can send messages itself to reconcile the view of the, the objects. So I think there's a very concrete example that we will see very soon. Okay, so this is a very complicated slide. I think it's supposed to have some animation, but the animation was in Keynote, so not very helpful to my uh, non-Macintosh system. But anyway, uh, so just ignore the, the words for now and look at the left-hand side. Um, okay, so represent actors with this um, A. So A1 and A2 are two actors in the system. Think of actors like lightweight threads, kind of. Um, so the boxes represents the heap of the actors. Right? And the blue entities are the objects. So these are just, so this is, Pony is actually an object-oriented uh, language. You can, you can construct regular structs and classes and stuff. So, so they call them passive uh, entities, uh, where actors are considered the active entities. So here you have um, four objects, oh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and the arrows are, you can think of them as references, right? So the actor 1 has references to object 1 and 3 and so on. Okay, so that's the top part. The middle part is the message queue. So every actor has a message queue, that's how you actually, or a mailbox actually, that's how you actually send it messages. It goes into this queue and the actor just, you know, pops off pops off, uh, I guess on the left, uh, messages and, and you know, uh, runs its behavior on the, the arguments. <coughs> so that's the cues. Um, the working set is kind of like the objects this actor knows about, or he has seen before. And so correspondingly for every object he knows about, there is a count, which is the number, or which is the total weight of the references to that object. So this is going to be, as the title suggests, it's going to be a reference counting system. Right? So basically, and it's, it's sort of unidirectional, so we're only counting references from actors to objects. So it's from the active entities, the actors to the sort of passive entities, the objects. So we're counting how many, not, not really how many, but you can think of how many references are there from, from the actors to the objects. So this is how many references from actor A1 to all of these known uh, Entity, so we actually also include the actors themselves. This system can actually also um, garbage collect actors, but th that's not the focus of the paper. Actually, there's a different paper that talks about how to garbage collect the actors. So it, in this paper, we focus mainly on the garbage collection of the objects. So uh, is the actor counters the total of the objects that they have? No, it's it's a weighted count actually, just to be yeah precise. So it, it's not really the number of count. It's the, uh, so there's some weight factor inside. So, yeah, yeah, don't think of it as the number. Think of it as a weighted number. Uh, yeah, so there's some numbers, okay. Uh, oh, okay, and then I think there's some nice things which the gray cells represent owned objects. So again, you can see from here, so actor one owns object one and three, actor two owns object two and four. Right. Owned means belongs to the heap, yeah. So why doesn't A2 own all four in its own No, because it's actually like noted there on the right hand side that there's no entry for a. Ah, why there's no entry here, is it? Yeah. The one, I mean, what I think no space. <laughs> no, 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 because no. It, like, it explicitly mentions it, right? Yep. Sorry? Where does it say that? No, in um, the working set. No, A204. No oh, note, no, A2. Because A2 doesn't have all three, so it's not there. No, no, he's uh, talking about 04, 04. right? Oh. Ah. I think it's just no space, actually. Yeah. No, it definitely has a count, I'm sure. 
Oh, no. Uh, I think no, it's a okay. typo because your working set is <laughs> 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 04. So your count table should be 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, Not necessary. I mean, look at the definition. The ref count table for yeah. some addresses from the working set. And it explicitly mentions that there's no entry for it. So it looks like there's some insight to be um, Nope. I can't, I can't explain why. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So moving on. It says there's no entry, I mean, no, they don't show the entry, that's why. I would think there's just no space for it, actually. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I may be wrong. I'm just guessing. Um, okay, in any case, uh, so the approach here will be, how we're going to do this is, um, uh, how we're going to show that this, this algorithm actually works is we're going to define a number of invariants. So as in typically in any kind of proof of an algorithm, we define a number of invariants and we sort of show that the algorithm maintains its invariance as it sends objects back and forth between actors. Okay, so to define the conditions of the invariance, we need to define a few terms. Um, okay, so the first term is this uh, local reference count. So that's quite simple. That's just the reference count of the, let's look at this one, uh, LRC of O2. It's just the, the value in the count table of the owner of the object. So O2's owner is A2, so the local reference count for O2 is 4. And same for, well, by default, the actor is its own owner, so <coughs> local reference count of A1 is 12. So that's just, that's quite simple. Okay, the foreign reference count is sort of the inverse, so it is the, all the other counts, right? So all the non-owners of the actor, so what's the example here? Let's look at the, oh, using, it's always the actors, okay, never mind. So, uh, the form of reference count of A2 is, there's only one other actor in the system, so it's gonna be just A1. But if there were more actors, then you would add up all the, the, the A2 values in all the actors except for A2. So if there was an A3, then you would add up the value five plus the A3's value, right? Uh, yeah, so that's just it. Um, okay. Uh, and then there's one called the increment decrement count. So these are basically garbage collection specific messages that we are sending to reconcile our view of the um, the heap, the global heap, so to speak, because the heap is partitioned into many actors. So we need, we have to send messages between actors to reconcile the view. So this increment decrement count is the so there's there's a number here, right? So this means increment by one, but it could be a bigger number, increment by five, for example. Then there could be decrement count DEC. It's not shown here. Uh, so DEC messages. So you just add up all the, uh, and these are the, these are actually called weighted references. Now. That's why the number is not only can be one, can be larger numbers because it's weighted. So you just add up all the messages in in your queue. And these are okay. So the, the thing is, these are only sent to the owner, right? Because well, the owner is the one that has to take care of this this object, right? So whenever some other actor deals with this object. O1, he's gonna send a message to the owner, say, okay, here's what happened to this O1, your, your guy, right? Because, you know, it's being moved around, whatever. So, so these are only ever in the owner's queue. So, yeah. what does weighted reference mean for, for reference counting? I don't know about much about the field, so right. I, I have no idea. Weighted reference just means each reference is an integer number. It can be like, it doesn't have to be like just like an actual number of references per se. It's it's just a, it has a it can it can vary right. It can be like hundred five. Yeah. Uh, how do I explain? It's like uh, maybe it's like. Uh, so it, does it, it mean it's, like it's just a higher number is a stronger reference? Not really. Okay. Not really. Maybe because normally my reference counting right it's just one. It's just yeah. One. Uh, I think it. in um, this case, uh, this is like more of an optimization, I think. So I think we can just pretend we ignore the weighted case, actually. So I think what happens in here is there's this occasion where you have to send the same object many times. And then instead of sending these messages over and over again, it's get, get kind of inefficient. So we can just send like one message, hey, I'm going to potentially in the future send this like 100 times to some other guy. So I'll tell you increment 100 first. 
then I can do a lot of stuff with it. I don't have to tell you anymore because I told you one shot. Okay, okay. So, in, okay, so that, that's the sense of it, I guess. Okay, right. So we can, so if in, a, in a naive case, you can just imagine we always send increment one, sure. right? But I, I think there's some optimizations where we can batch it together and send right. increment 100. And then I do stuff with it, but I don't have to tell you. I, I told right. you ahead of time, gotcha. right? Yeah. So instead of every send, I gotta, I gotta, so I gotta update you. I just, I just tell you, you know, well, right. I, I, yeah. I'm gonna have five references to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, then I'll just do that, and then you forget about that for a while. Yeah. Okay. Then. Okay. So yeah. So that, that's the idea. Uh, increment reference count. Okay. Yeah. This part is a bit dry, but never mind. Okay. Uh, and then one, one last part is the application <laughs> message count. So we always write this as APP. So these are the application specific messages, which is like in your program, you say this actor sends a message to that actor. This is in your special, in your own program, right? This is part of the garbage collection uh, protocol. So you don't, you don't have to worry about this. This happens automatically. So these are the ones you program in yourself, right? So these are called application messages and they may contain um, references to objects, of course. Otherwise, why would you send them? So <laughs> now they can add up all these as... Um, so note actually that um, uh, the definition here uh, what does it say? Number which contains uh, alpha, where alpha is the object, or ad addresses reachable from alpha and the owners of alpha. But uh, which actually just involves you need to trace the you need to trace this object if it's more complex. If this object has, for example, O one actually has links to O two, so this 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 message at O one. It, um, also affects O2 because anyone with reference to O1 actually can refer to O2 because of this link here, right? So you're going to actually worry about um, all the reachable uh, objects from the message, from the address in the message. So we consider all the reachable addresses as also sort of contained in this message, <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, all right. Now. Uh, okay, I think we can skip this. Not terribly important. Okay, and th the key invariant actually is, is, is WF0. So the key invariant uh, says that actually tells us how we define this uh, local reference count. So, uh, uh, hey, something like this. The local reference count of an object is in fact the same as ignoring messages, I ignoring the IDC and AMC is actually the same as the uh, sum of the foreign reference counts and then whenever you send messages which is the AMC part you also send this increment decrement messages to to update the uh, the owner because you're transferring your um, ownership in some sense or your references and the rest are just kind of um, intuitive well, I guess so it's like reference counts are always non-negative because it doesn't make sense to talk about negative references um, and this reachable stuff, like, I think, which is, which is quite obvious. So, so for example, WF3 says if a message, an object is reachable from some message, then it cannot have a count of zero. Otherwise, when you have a count of zero, it'd be collected, right? So just for, just for correctness, when you have this object in some message, it has to have a positive count so that it will be alive when it reaches. And really, the whole point of all this different invariants, and the first one is really the one that's most important, the rest is sort of the intuitive things. Um, it's really to have this consequence at the end, and that is basically saying if an object is not reachable from the, the owner, and the count, and this count is zero, which also implies that nobody else has a reference to the object with address alpha, and there are no messages with uh, alpha in the content, then this is implies this is globally unreachable, right? So that means it can be it can be collected as garbage. And the, the crucial point is that this condition, this for two conditions, actually this is a conjunction of two conditions, is checkable uh, purely by looking at your count, the owner's count table. You don't have to ask other people. Right? Yeah, that's right. In fact, what happens is other people tell you when they do things, yeah. so that you kind of update. So, but. Eventually, just check your own tables, and then when you see like, uh, when you, there's a tracing step, when you trace the object, you cannot reach it, and then its count is zero, which also means nobody else, because you can't reach it, doesn't mean somebody else can't, right? Sure. But then this additional condition means somebody else can't. So I can't reach it, and everybody else 
can't reach it, right? Essentially, that's what it says in English, yeah. which obviously means nobody can reach it because these are, these are the whole, all the entities in the system, right? So you, you can collect it. It's basically garbage, right? So, so that's key. Though. The key is that you don't have to ask anybody anything to do garbage collection. So every actor can do garbage collection independently of every other actor. And that's why it's um, efficient also, right? Because you don't have to check anything, you don't have to ask anything, right? You just check your own tables and then, okay, this is garbage, I can, I can get rid of it. But if it's not enough that the local ref count of alpha is zero, mm -hmm. then how do you check that it's unreachable? So the name local ref count is kind of a misleading thing. It's actually totally up all the foreign counts. <laughs> I actually never count my own references. I just do this check actually. Reachable. This reachable is for myself. This is actually asking about everybody else. Although it's called the local ref count, oh, but it's kind, it's kind of a... I see what you're not a local view of remote ref really, Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's, it's kind of a funny name, right? So, yeah, yeah. So this is actually the sum of all the foreign counts. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's not my count. I actually don't care about the count. I just care about reachability actually. So I can't reach it and... Nobody else can see this. Nobody else, and this includes also, of course, not just actors. Actually, this includes messages if you if you think about it. Yeah. So this includes messages as well as other actors, because it could be in transit, right? Yeah. So nobody can see it, but it's somewhere in between, like in, in the messages, right? So okay. So basically, locally, you do a traditional it's a GC trace, yeah. Based on mark, uh, on just do marking. Yeah. And then you also, but, but for remote references, you do reference. Ref this is kind of like the global view in some sense. Yeah, this is the global yeah, view. But, but the global view is yeah. ref counting yeah. and locally you do reachability. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So together the two, yeah, exactly. Hybrid system. We can prove that it's unreachable. You mean just if you, you reach about like, um, the local LRC is um, zero? You yeah. can't, you can't collect it. So I mean, it's a one, one, zero, zero, one, then. Uh, and using the saw. No, no, this is N, N, N. Both must be, both must be, both must be satisfied. Oh, if you can reach it and that is zero, you cannot collect it. Otherwise, what you're using is gone, right? I'm using this. <laughs> okay. The saw is gone now. It can't be, right? Basically, if, if the local reference is zero, then this degenerates to the one single threaded. Oh uh, yeah. Basically, that means this is a, this is a, my, my personal object. Yeah. Nobody else sees this. So yeah. Okay. So that's actors don't have to be individual threats, right? Or are they? No, they're not. They're not. That's 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 the thing, right? So they are. They are. They they're like green. They're like green threats. So yeah. actually, what happens is, if you look at the actual implementation, so there'll be like a scheduler, and then they'll create actual threats, which is equal to the number of cores, and you schedule the actors to run on each of your cores. We can have you can have millions of actors. They are pretty lightweight, actually. Yeah. And and the cool thing is they have separate heaps. It's yeah. kind of like the Erlang model. Um, so where does okay? Let's see. Okay, uh, okay, I thought about the how you do the this is the marking basic uh, this is like unfortunately the animation is not here, so uh, so what you do is you do marking like, basically right? and, then, and then you trace from your fields. Okay, so the thing you think about this also is that the garbage collection happens outside of your behavior. So your behavior as I said is logically one atomic step to the garbage collector. So what happens is after you run your behavior, it may choose to run the collector. So which is why there's no problem of uh, Concurrency, right? Oh, because we oh, never oh. run it together with the behaviors, right? So we always run it after a behavior. I mean, you can, you can check whether there's a lot of garbage. If not, now we can do another behavior. Sure. It does, okay, we're kind of full, let's do a GC. And then you can do this because you have split it up into this actor model, so that each yeah. step is small enough that you can do this at that level. Exactly. Or, or, the, or the popular term now is microservices, right? You can think of, yes. you can think of actors as your micro sure. component services, whatever, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so there's no need to worry about um, tracing your stack and all that. There's no stack because this is when the actor is uh, <coughs> between between jobs, between jobs, so to speak, right? So there's no there's no active stack. So you just trace from the fields, yep. actually. So the actor is like a class. He has some fields and all that. So you can just start marking these things as reachable and so on. And then all the U. So this is I think A two doing GC, right? Yeah. So A two doing GC. It has no. Um, well, I think yeah, it's been O3 here. La. So O3 actually, I think it's gone, right? Because O3 is not reachable. This is post animation. Yeah, I think yeah, post animation. I think all the all the animation finished. So basically, when when O3 O3 is gone, so whatever count you had in your table, you just uh, set it to zero. What you gotta tell the owner? Okay, I didn't see this guy anymore. It's it's gone. 
Never so it's not tell the gun, right? Because A1 still yeah, owns yeah. it. It's oh, just A2, A2, I from A2. Yeah, about, yeah, yeah. No, unreachable, as right? As as unreachable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. I can't see it. A2 can't see it. This is all about A2. La. So whenever I say me, I'm, I'm saying A2. So A2 can't see the O3 anymore. So I set it to zero. That previously was one, assuming. So I tell, uh, I tell the owner, okay, so uh, what I saw previously was should be gone. So whenever I, it was one, I should subtract. Of course, when he sees this message, it would, as you would expect, update its number. Uh, so you would, it would actually update its number to zero. And I also don't see it, right? Oh, later you'll see, okay, let's see this. So A1 is doing garbage collection now. So A1, blah, 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 and then, and so on. And it process all the messages, sorry. Assume it process all the messages, right? So, uh, and O3 is unreachable because, you know, there's no links to it. And it's zero because you process the decrement message. And now we can collect uh, O3. We turn it back to uh, the memory allocator. It's basically called free on it. Right. So the, the queue need to be empty when the garbage collection is performed? No. No, not, not necessarily. Uh, in this case, yes, but in general, no. It doesn't have to be, yeah. yeah. There's also one, one other condition which I, I think it, it's not. Did I? Oh, it's not in here. Yeah, so that, that comes to this fifth thing, which I didn't talk about. The pending changes count. Uh, this is required, actually, so that um, one of the conditions says that the, the prefix sum of the queue cannot be zero when the message still exists, which makes sense. So even though it's zero now, it could be non-zero later. Sure. So any case, uh, that, that's kind of a detail. Yeah, but it doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to be empty. So you can you can you can process some messages because each of these is like doing a behavior, right? Each of this uh, message, uh, you can process some and then you can do GC. Yeah. So up to the schedule to decide when you want to do GC. Uh, so I will not talk about this. Okay, so basically, what what when do you need to uh, bother with the GC stuff? Right? So when you send and receive messages, because you get new references or you get rid of the ones you have. Right. Or when you receive the special messages, you're going to update your count. And yeah, let's look at an example, right? So what happens if you, if you run a statement like this? So uh, yeah, you have A1, and you set your F to, F is this link, to null. So this is running the behavior, running your, um, your code, right? So actually, when you do this, um, you don't have to do anything. Yep. Because we don't care. We only check at the end, right? We don't do anything in between behavior. So at the end of a behavior, when we, let's say, have not much memory left, we may do a, this whole mark and trace business. And we'll eventually discover that O3 is unreachable. Right? And then we will say, okay, and then if it's zero, it's not zero, so we can't kill it. But if it's zero, then we will kill it. Right? So this is fine. So this is good because we don't have to worry about, it doesn't slow down your normal behaviors. Not unlike your, like, say, read barriers or write barriers. Uh, oh, and here's where things get complex. So if you need to send a message, so if A1 sends a message to A2, here we go, with the object O1, okay, A1 and, and A1 is the owner of O1, right? A1 is the owner of O1. Yeah, great, it's a great color box. It means it's the owner. So how, so, and this is the key, um, the key invariant actually. So how do you preserve this? So what happens is that uh, obviously you have the you have that one AMC01 becomes plus one because we just sent a new message. So uh, the number of uh, references in that message in, in all the messages combined is incremented by one. What can A1 do uh, to balance the equation? So it's, I guess it's like chemistry. You got to balance the equation, right? So basically, you can just increment. Uh, this number, the LRC, which makes sense because the LRC is the global view, right? So now I introduce a new message. I have to update myself to say that now in the global view, there's this new message with O1 inside. So I have to increment, uh, this is the LRC, right? because RC of A101 is essentially the LRC because A1 is the owner of O1, right? And okay, these other ones are because all these other things are also in the message because this is the owner of O1. This is reachable from okay. O1. This is the owner of the thing reachable from O1. 
So they're technically part of the message yeah. indirectly in some sense. So you also got to increment. Uh, oh no. Yeah, you got to increment. This is subtract. Let's do this. Is, we do O2. Forget about this. Anyway, this is this part. Oh, O2 is because, sorry. So O2 is because, um, yeah, so I have to explain this. O2 is not my object. This is A1, right? Remember? So this is so this is the owner, owner. This is the non-owner. So the non-owner case is kind of the inverse, like basically. So you got to. This is actually the so-called the foreign reference count, because this is the count of a one with respect to o two. So you got to subtract uh, from there, right? Because you incremented there, so you got to subtract from here to sort of balance the the equation, right? And o two a two because. Uh, it is the owner of O2 and it's not myself, so it's also not I have to subtract. Uh, yeah, I think there's just one more ah, causality. Actually, causality is, is important, I guess you can see why. Because otherwise, these messages get out of order. So it's important that these increment and command messages are received in the correct order. Otherwise, if you receive too many decrement messages at the same time, you would think that it's actually gone. So which is sort of why the causality thing is important. So they have to come in in kind of the right sequence. Yeah. Otherwise, your view of the world is a bit incorrect. So, okay. Uh, the other key thing that is enabled by this is that, of course, you could say that, well, what if, you know, I, I send an object and some other, I do all this tracing and all that business, but wouldn't, you, you might argue that when I do all this tracing business, well, what if O2 gets changed by A2? Because when I do tracing from A1, right, I will actually trace until um, O2, right? But I don't own O2. So A2 might be running its behavior and doing stuff with O2. Does that make sense? Which is bad, right? Because I'm trying to trace like how things are going, but A2 is like modifying O2, adding links and all that stuff, right? So that's not too good, right? <laughs> So it turns out with the type system of uh, the language, it's, it's the compiler can actually prove that that's not possible. So the fact that uh, O2 is visible from A1 means actually nobody else is actually modifying it. Uh, this is something from the type system actually. So when you compile the program, it, it will not allow you to, uh, it will not allow A2 to actually be modifying O2 when it's visible from A1. Because that will be concurrent mutable state, which is not allowed by the programming language itself. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it's immutable, for example, it's one of the possibilities. So, so O2 could be an immutable kind of thing. So A2 could not possibly modify this when it's being traced uh, from A1. Oh, it's not O2 that is immutable, it's... The reference, the reference in some sense, the reference, yeah. exactly, right, right. Of course, A, uh, A1 could later modify it, like, because this is A1's behavior, right? So A1 could be the one able to modify it, but... Uh, from the A2's point of view, it's uh, it, yeah, through this reference, it's not able to modify O2. So actually, the, if you look at a different paper talks about this, introduce something like, I'm not sure whether it's a bit of a cognitive overload, there are six different types of references to, to track the who can modify what. So, um, but the good thing is this allows us to, to say that it's not possible. Uh. You can't get any concurrent problems here. Okay, I think that's basically it. So all these basically are... Uh, no, actually. Um, so that's interesting. The other interesting thing about Pony, maybe at a different paper. I no can talk about it here, actually. So you can okay. Let's look at some look at look at some numbers, actually. Or oh, look at some graphs. Um, so this is con comparing Pony 01.5. I think now we're at 02.1 uh, with a bunch of other things. So the most obvious one is comparing with Erlang, uh, which is the green line. Kef is the C++ actor framework. Um, it's written in C++. I think Charm is also a C++ based um, actor framework. And this is um, creating many, many actors and also doing GC on them at the same time. Uh, the pony isn't that fantastic. The pony is the black line, I think, right? Especially when you go to many, many cores. What's the weird peak what? Uh, at like three actors? This one? Uh, two yeah. actors. Oh, this is two cores, not 
two cores. Oh, two cores, sorry. Yeah. Two cores is uh, about a million plus actors. Sorry, yeah. yeah. What, what? No, no two, idea. Two, two cores is the smallest number of cores where you already have Contention. overhead. Synchronization. Uh, all yeah, so you things. already have overhead from synchronization right. which you don't have with one core. But sure, then, sure. Okay. But I guess with like three or four, you get more work done and your overhead is actually relatively less. So this is more charm, yeah. But this, this yeah. isn't exactly selling pony, right? Because you'd expect that that not fantastic. Get, you know, all the other ones would not. It's more like comparable. I guess the, the point. You increase cores because that's yeah. the whole point, right? That you can increase the cores and you not you don't suffocate in, in yeah. synchronization. I guess this means it's kind of it's kind of flat, right? So it doesn't get affected by this. If you yeah. have only two cores, then yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you should always get two cores. Yeah. <laughs> well, you might have more machine. You might have big machines. Okay, so let's look at something better. I think. So this is this is better for. <laughs> so this is to do with the messages, So it means you're sending lots of messages to all the mailboxes. Uh, oh, so where does the first? Okay, so I didn't talk about where this is from Erlang actually. So if you know message, if you know actor framework, so Erlang is the most famous. Uh, and Erlang has a little problem with this because Erlang essentially says you share nothing at all. So basically when you send messages, you just make a copy of it. Mm -hmm. So there's no sharing, so that's perfectly fine. But making a copy takes some time. Uh, and you notice in Pony, when I share a message, I literally just share the reference to the object. Yeah, yeah. Because of the guarantees that uh, if I send to you, I can't modify at the same time and so on. Because of the type system, which I'm not talking about. But because of that, I can send you the whole thing. Because nobody else can touch it. Right. So. Uh, it's actually more performant when you send lots of messages because you don't have to. It's essentially what's called zero copy messaging. Yep. So I don't make copies of the messages. I just send you the whole reference. Uh, but I have to do this tracing business to figure out who is reachable from the message. That's the caveat actually. Um, but so this does pretty well on lots of messages. So more really, I think this is to do some. This is a factoring example. So a bunch of messaging and computation combined, uh, and it does quite okay. And actually, I think Pony. If you look at the code. Uh, and this is a uh, now on GitHub and it's still pretty young. It's mostly written in C actually. I think if I look at the the master's thesis, this started out mostly as a C library, and then they wrote a compiler on top of it to call the runtime, which is in, which is basically in C, which does all this mailboxing and sending messages business. So Pony can think of it as like a C, a C thing. It's a C++ but not C++. It's C but the way the it's compiler C++ works... Plus, C++. Yeah, it's it sort of... The runtime is written in C and when it's compiled down to kind of LLVM, it's, it's backed by LLVM and it calls into the C runtime. Uh, but the compiler, when it compiles, makes sure that you don't have this data races basically, right? You can't modify something when somebody else is reading and stuff like that. So uh, that's why it gives you this kind of guarantees. Right? Otherwise, you couldn't have... You couldn't, you couldn't use this algorithm in fact, right? This algorithm depends on the fact that you can't modify something when somebody else has a reference, which is guaranteed by the compiler. Um, and this is actually a, it's called Gilead Giga Updates Per Second. So it's to test the random access memory, actually. And this is comparing against the um, message passing interface. MPI, I think, is a classical C interface for message passing. I mean, MPI doesn't share anything, right? So it's... But this is yeah, testing it's mainly the memory the theory, updates. Right? The, the with MPI, you have to send them. You, you don't use MPI on a single machine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true, probably. Yeah. If you use uh, open MP, then probably it just. Mm. Mm. Okay. This is Pony 1.0. It's different versions of Pony. So I, yeah. Anyway, uh, but all this code is open source. You can run. The, you can run the benchmarks yourself. Uh, okay. So I think the interesting thing here to take away is basically. The combination of this pervasive actor framework, so you use it also for GC by sending GC specific messages to update the owning actor. So the two concepts, one is the implicit ownership, right? So the which is kind of obvious, right? The actor that creates the object owns it, and then the other actor sends it special messages to update and so on. And and you you don't need any synchronization and there's no it's because it's all done through the same messaging framework. So you really utilize this framework fully, right? So there's no messaging, there's no stop the world, there's no barriers, there's no special things. So just purely based on messaging. And yeah, you don't have to, you can only just need to check your own tables. You don't have to ask any global things. Then you can do the G-Sync. And yeah, use it for the protocol of the garbage collection. And more stuff. This is actually the iCoops loops paper. I think it's the implementation, compilation of 
uh, object-oriented languages, programs, and systems. It's a European conference in object-oriented languages. Ah, so you can check out Pony Language. It's kind of bare bones, actually. I have it here. I don't know too much about Forzies, but I don't think that's a Pony. Yeah, it's a. Uh, <laughs> that's not. That's that's an Orca. There's no. Apparently, they have no icons. Maybe someone, someone might be the first person to. Uh, yeah, to create the like create the icon, right? Okay, yeah. Half pony, half orc at the end. And the then... Pony, uh, the color is still... And here's some of the examples from the paper. If you look at the GUPS example. An orca eating a pony. This is an example of what? For example, pony coat might look like, if you're wondering. So, BE is the behavior or the... The, the this asynchronous messages that you sent. Okay, this is like what pony code. It looks a little bit like Scala somehow because of the way. Oh, because Scala has the actor. You get they do this colon thing, you know, like uh, they also this is also statically typed, of course, because otherwise you couldn't prove the uh, the no data race thing. Right? So it's statically typed and compiled to LLVM and then to native code, and it looks something like this. Yeah. I think it looks weird to me, all the try and end blocks. But anyways. Uh, yeah, in case you're wondering what. So this is, you get to define like actor, and then you have, these are your fields. These are your like behaviors, the asynchronous things. Yeah. Yep, that's, that's that. Sorry, where was I? Questions? If there are any? Oops. Yes. Does this allow for oh. higher order messages? Like sending behaviors? Yeah. You can send lambdas, so okay. that much I know. Uh, well, I guess which might be what you want to do. Yeah. You can send a lambda. So I think it's quite common to send a message a lambda, which is like a kind of like a callback. So it's like after you do this, call that thing, so that, um, yeah, mm -hmm. so that that's possible. You can send you can send lambdas. I don't know why it's not scrolling. But. Oh, this is the no, last but slide. Those, those lambdas, I mean, do they have are they proper lambdas? Do they have closures which have, can have references to objects? Because that's where it, that's interesting, right? If you um, can, if you don't have closures, then lambdas are no big deal. You can, of course, but it's again bounded by the property of this. Uh, so in this language, you cannot, for example, I don't know if you know things like concurrent hash map, for example, like in Java, right? you can have a hash map which everybody modifies all the threads. You can't program it in this language, for one thing. Mm -hmm. Because just just not allowed by the type system, you can't have one object that's at the mod at the modified by multiple actors at the same time. So that's just disallowed completely. Yeah. Yeah. Paraphrasing this, you are yeah. saying that you cannot have more than one person having reference to that object. Uh, not really. So because there are different types of references. Because the object doesn't cross the boundary, the, the object stays with the owner. Yes, yes, so in a sense. So you only pass a reference yeah. to, yes. to A2 to 101. They get a reference yeah. to, from, from A1 to yeah. O1. Right? Yeah. So, but can A2 pass this reference to A3? Yes, yes, of course. But at only one time, there's only one reference to one object. Uh, no, well, no, not that's really. That's already not true, right? Because both A, I mean, you have two references to O2. You have one from A2 so and another from O1. I guess it, it draws it as all black lines, but in reality, there are like six different colors of lines. Mm -hmm. So it, it all draws it at the same kind of line, but it, in, in reality, there are different kinds of arrows. Yeah, kinds so, of for example, I think it's fair to say there's only one actor that can ever modify right, an no, object. There's, there's only one. Right. Yes. Yes. That's Only correct. one person can write. So it's like you do new text without new texts. It's more like you have a dedicated actor for writing. Something so, like that. So who does the writing? A1? No, anybody. Mm -hmm. it, could, it may not be A1. It could be A1 may, ha may transfer this right to somebody else. But when it transfers, A1 must destroy its own right. writable reference. Because you can't have two, right? That's kind of, you know, the universe kind of blows up. So you have to transfer well, to some other actor. Pen, so in a sense, yeah. Really I got to transfer my right to... Well, only, only one guy can, can have the pen to, to write those questions. Actually, when, when someone is writing, in fact, 
nobody else can read it either because it could also be inconsistent when you allow that, right? Because you might in between because writing. Yeah. To, to this guy, it doesn't matter because every single act is an atomic. So you have to write and read. You cannot write read at the same time. No, it could be different actors. So one could be like if A2 was writing O2, which is actually not possible in this case. Uh, then it's not possible that there's actually a path from A1 to O2. Because A1 could read, because they could run simultaneously, the, the behaviors yeah, could simultaneously execute. But when you say you write to yeah. O2, what does that mean, right? Because Sorry? it's the references that you can change. So yeah. if A2 changes O2, that just yeah. means it has an O2 prime, and the arrow from A2 now points no, to no, 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 as in changes one of the fields. The I mean, O2 could have fields, right? Like a, It's like a pair of thing. Maybe it could have, it could have a pair of whatever. Something is not drawn here, but you could change one of the references to now, you could you could change it to another object, right? As an update, literally destructively update the field of O2. Then you mean but O2 wouldn't that be modeled as separate objects then? Yeah, okay. separate objects. O2 can have reference to O1. Yeah. Yeah. In this case it actually has a, has a cyclic reference, right? But actually it doesn't matter in this case. Because we don't count all these we don't count all these O to O references. No, you don't count yeah. O to O references yeah. because they don't write each other. You only count A to A to O references. Because A to A to O, you can write. In some sense, yes, yeah. You you only care about the A to O reference. So that means there can only be one A to O reference. One write A to O reference at one at one time. For writing, yes. Right. Writing. But reading, you can you can have multiple reading. Yeah, but if so, no one's so writing. How, how does it guarantee? It, it I don't see how it guarantees that. Uh. It's not in this paper and it's not in this presentation. It's in a different article, actually. Okay. Talking about a type system. So, yeah, that there will be a different talk. So I don't want to go into that. Yeah. <laughs> you could you could do that. I think you can imagine. If you, you could do that in your program by hand if you're very careful when you're writing it, basically, right? It's just that the compiler checks that you are careful instead of you checking that I am carefully moving this around without, you know. Yeah, that's better. So the compiler checks for you. That's all, basically. When it can be done. So, but it requires, I think, a bit too many types of references, six types. So, I think the question in the community is whether that's too many for people to keep in their heads, that there are six different types. And you kind of need to convert between the types. Because, uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah. So, yeah, okay. So is this subsumed by Rust? <coughs> um, it's similar, but different. There are some types here actually that are not representable in Rust. Mm -hmm. I think in Rust you might have to... I guess someone said that in Rust you build some of these um, ownership based by using Rust primitives. Actually, you can, But these are sort of inbuilt into the language. So the six types of references are built into the language. Um, but they actually kind of shows that these six are all you ever need to, to talk about the references. Um, so they actually did a comparison with Rust like in this paper. You can look at it. So they... They have some things that you can't represent in Rust, I think. Yeah, but there's a higher, you know, cognitive overload to remember the six different types of references. So these arrows, as I said, it's not just one kind of arrow. There are six kinds of arrows, and it gets um, a bit crazy. Yeah. Uh, but I think one thing interesting is worth checking out the the repository if you're interested in contributing to a language. So uh, mostly written in C. So if you know C, good enough. Uh, there's some C++ bits that, that talks to the LLVM backend, but that's the, and then there's some is it, they're using a Google test library also written in C++. But the main runtime and the compiler is written in C. Yeah. So if you're interested, check this out. You can see how they do the how they actually do the scheduling of the actors. They actually you know create regular OS threads and schedule them and so on. So it's a pretty small active community I think right now. It's a good time to get in if you're interested. Yeah. So I think this is in a space where you have um, you have the actor model, you have sending with no copies, and you have the compiler proving guarantees that you can never get into kind of concurrent update mutable st concurrent mutable state problems. So it's a pretty interesting space. I think they're they're trying to push this for um, financial applications, but we'll see how how that goes. Yeah. All right. To understand that from the point of view yeah. of a big cluster. Yes. A big distributed system is good, but like out of consideration, what could be the bottlenecks here? So, what happens if you say have a central node that sends the messages to everybody, and then the central node say 
hands or is just encumbered by the garbage collection from thousands of tenants. So actually for this one, this is purely on a single machine. Yeah, because that, that's basically what uh, made com so crappy. Right? Like what? When you think about com? It. Oh, yeah. common, mo common object model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The I'm not familiar yeah, with it, but I heard about we it. We saw a uh, ref count in. I see. With, yeah. with interprocess reference and stuff. And, and, and that's actually one of the basic. D D com, uh, D com. Yes, exactly. One yeah, of the basic sorry. failure modes. I think Michael about it. Really? Okay, yeah. I have to go look yeah, it up. In, in D com, it sucks because you, you, know, you have a process dying and suddenly you have all these unaccounted references. Uh, references yeah, and other processes. Your, your, your reference count can never go to zero. That's where your memory just grew and grew. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, so, you, you, so for, for a, like a single application running on many cores, this makes sense. But I think if you want to have a cluster, it becomes yeah. you know, unreliable. So uh, as, as soon as your cluster reaches a certain number of nodes, you No, I mean, as soon as it reaches two, two more than one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. certain number more than one. Yeah, I think right now they're in the no, no, process of working on the distributed the big, version. I mean, two is not a big cluster because you can finish computation when on two nodes in a reasonable no, 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 time. But what if you have a thousand nodes mm. or ten thousand nodes, it's statistically impossible to have the whole cluster working all nodes at the same time. No, no you need his propagation and you need his and, and, and divide by two L2. <laughs> uh, you need to count the electrons propagating along. No, the no, really, it's like the, I, I hear that people that have sufficient number of nodes have so basically one guy per say hundred <coughs> to just replace the equipment. So. No, but as soon as you have two or robot. As soon as you have just two machines or even just two processes, mm -hmm. right? If one of them goes away because of anything, not necessarily a hardware failure, but just any any reason then none of the invariants yes, so, so, so yeah what i say basically for two nodes it's not that painful even for 32 cores it's not that painful if no but if it happens but once a, a while no but my point is there's a a qualitative difference between running something on a thousand cores and running something on even just two processes and, and the difference is that in two process case, if one of, one of them can go away without the other, whereas if, even if you have a thousand cores, but if you have you know, one process, it, it's all or nothing, and you don't care what happens after the whole thing comes back. Yeah, sure. so, so here we have perfect system for like... Multiple. One machine. Yeah, exactly. exactly. One, one, machine. one machine, multiple cores, yes. No, 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 but, but the number of actors, do they stay the same throughout? Oh, no, no, you can mm. create new actors dynamically on the fly, yeah. So the, then your counting, your count, your reference count table suddenly just increased. Everybody's reference count table yeah. increased yeah. by one. Well, no, yeah, not everyone. Yeah. I mean, not everyone. It's only those who well, have seen those who have seen that before. Yeah. yeah. When you when you receive a message, you got to construct some new uh, yeah. slots for uh, things that you have so not. So you don't need to speak construct. You, you no, 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 no. start to uh, yeah. No, like, yeah. no, 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 no. You, you don't have to. Right? If you never see those, stuff, you, you get bother. messages. That's when you start. That's when you need to account. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, actors are, are lightweight actually, so you can construct millions of them. So that shouldn't be the problem. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but, but if you have millions of actors yeah. um, interacting millions of objects in between them, then then the reference count. Then you have a. Become, you yeah. So I guess you, you shouldn't be sending up. every object to every actor. That would be kind of a bad even, idea. Uh, limitation for the. Table. Sorry? Yes, yes, of course. The count table will, will grow, right, as the size of the actors who have seen the object. So if you have many actors seeing many objects, then there will be a big overhead for this thing. Yeah. I, I'm not saying... But I think in practice it's not that common to do like multi-cast or whatever <laughs> in the actor system. Yeah. Demand grows, but you... you, you Give a give a certain trailer that there is the hidden component of this algorithm is the type system of cloning. Yes. Do you plan to develop A different time, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Another time. Another time, yeah. Maybe but you can, or just to mention for the distributed part of Pony. Yeah, I wouldn't mind to, to like skip talking for like sure. a minute at least. 
there is a master's thesis uh, for distributed polling, no, no, multiple no. machines. Okay. So in case you're wondering about how do you handle machine failures and stuff like that. I think there's no paper on it, but there's a thesis. If papers, then we can pick. Oh, sure, sure. Read and, and check whether we are able. Sure. Sure. I'll update it in the event. Okay. All right. Thank you for listening. <laughs>